This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Cory Samuel. The Wood Beyond the World by William Morris. Chapter 26 They Come to the Folk of the Bears. On they went, and before long they were come up on to the down country, where was scarce a tree, save gnarled and knotty thorn-bushes here and there, but nought else higher than the whin. And here, on these upper lands, they saw that the pastures were much burned with the drought, albeit summer was not worn old. Now they went, making due south toward the mountains, whose heads they saw from time to time, rising deep blue over the bleak greyness of the downland ridges. And so they went, till at last, hard on sunset, after they had climbed long over a high bent, they came to the brow thereof, and looking down, beheld new tidings. There was a wide valley below them, greener than the downs which they had come over, and greener yet amidmost, from the watering of a stream which, all beset with willows, wound about the bottom. Sheep and neat were pasturing about the dale, and moreover a long line of smoke was going up straight into the windless heavens, from the midst of a ring of little round houses built of turfs, and thatched with reed. And beyond that, toward an east-lying bight of the dale, they could see what looked like to a doom-ring of big stones, though there were no rocky places in that land. About the cooking-fire, amidst of the houses, and here and there otherwhere, they saw, standing, or going to and fro, huge figures of men and women, with children playing about betwixt them. They stood and gazed down at it for a minute or two, and though all were at peace there, yet to Walter, at least, it seemed strange and awful. He spake softly, as though he would not have his voice reach those men, though they were, forsooth, out of earshot of anything save a shout. Are these, then, the children of the bear? What shall we do now? She said, Yea, of the bear they be, though there be other folks of them far and far away to the northward and eastward, near to the borders of the sea. And as to what we shall do, let us go down at once, and peacefully. Indeed, by now there will be no escape from them, for lo you, they have seen us. Forsooth, some three or four of the big men had turned them toward the bent whereon stood the twain, and were hailing them, in huge rough voices, wherein, howsoever, seemed to be no anger or threat. So the maid took Walter by the hand, and thus they went down quietly, and the bear folk, seeing them, stood all together, facing them, to abide their coming. Walter saw of them, that, though they were very tall and bigly made, they were not so far above the stature of men as to be marvels. The carls were long-haired and shaggy of beard, and their hair all red or tawny. Their skins, where their naked flesh showed, were burned brown with sun and weather, but to a fair and pleasant brown, naught like to blackamoors. The queens were comely and well-eyed, nor was there anything of fierce or evil-looking about either the carls or the queens, but somewhat grave and solemn of aspect were they. Clad were they all, saving the young men children, but somewhat scantily, and in naught save sheepskins or deerskins. For weapons they saw amongst them clubs, and spears headed with bone or flint, and ugly axes of big flints set in wooden handles, nor was there, as far as they could see, either now or afterward, any bow amongst them but some of the young men seemed to have slings done about their shoulders. Now, 
when they were come but three fathom from them, the maid lifted up her voice, and spake clearly and sweetly. Hail, ye folk of the bears! We have come amongst you, and that for your good and not for your hurt. Wherefore we would know if we be welcome. There was an old man who stood foremost in the midst, clad in a mantle of deerskins, worked very goodly, and with a gold ring on his arm, and a chaplet of blue stones on his head, and he spake, Little are ye, but so goodly, that if ye were but bigger, we should deem that ye were come from the God's house. Yet have I heard, that how mighty soever may the gods be, and chiefly our God, they be at whiles naught so bigly made as we of the bears. How this may be, I wot not. But if ye be not of the gods, or their kindred, then are ye mere aliens, and we know not what to do with aliens, save we meet them in battle, or give them to the god, or save we make them children of the bear. But yet again, ye may be messengers of some folk who would bind friendship and alliance with us, in which case ye shall at the least depart in peace, and whiles ye are with us shall be our guests in all good cheer. Now, therefore, we bid you declare the matter unto us. Then spake the maid, Father, it were easy for us to declare what we be unto you here present, but meseemeth ye who be gathered round the fire here this evening are less than the whole tale of the children of the bear. So it is, maiden, said the elder, that many more children hath the bear. This then we bid you, said the maid, that ye send the tokens round and gather your people to you, and when they be assembled in the doom ring, then shall we put our errand before you, and according to that shall ye deal with us. Thou hast spoken well, said the elder, and even so had we bidden you ourselves. Tomorrow, before noon, shall ye stand in the doom ring in this dale, and speak with the children of the bear. Therewith he turned to his own folk, and called out something, whereof those twain knew not the meaning, and there came to him, one after another, six young men, unto each of whom he gave a thing from out his pouch, but what it was Walter might not see, save that it was little and of small account. To each, also, he spake a word or two, and straight they set off running, one after the other, turning toward the bent which was over against that whereby the twain had come into the dale, and were soon out of sight in the gathering dusk. Then the elder turned him again to Walter and the maid, and spake, Man and woman, whatsoever ye may be, or whatsoever may abide you to-morrow, to-night ye are welcome guests to us, so we bid you come eat and drink at our fire. So they sat, all together, upon the grass, round about the embers of the fire, and ate curds and cheese, and drank milk in abundance, and as the night grew on them, they quickened the fire, that they might have light. This wild folk talked merrily amongst themselves, with laughter enough and friendly jests, but to the newcomers they were few spoken, though, as the twain deemed, for no enmity that they bore them. But this found Walter, that the young ones, both men and women, seemed to find it a hard matter to keep their eyes off them, and seemed, withal, to gaze on them with somewhat of doubt, or, it might be, of fear. So when the night was wearing a little, the elder arose, and bade the twain to come with him, and led them to a small house or booth, which was amidmost of all, and somewhat bigger than the others, and he did them to wit, that they should rest there that night, and bade them sleep in peace, and without fear till the morrow. So they entered, and found beds thereon of heather and ling, and they laid them down sweetly, like brother and sister, when they had kissed each other. 
but they noted that four brisk men lay without the booth and across the door, with their weapons beside them, so that they must needs look upon themselves as captives. Then Walter might not refrain him, but spake. Sweet and dear friend, I have come a long way from the quay at Langton, and the vision of the dwarf, the maid, and the lady, and for this kiss wherewith I have kissed thee e'en now, and the kindness of thine eyes, it was worth the time and the travail. But to-morrow, meseemeth, I shall go no further in this world, though my journey be far longer than from Langton hither. And now, may God and all hallows keep thee amongst this wild folk, whenas I shall be gone from thee. She laughed, low and sweetly, and said, Dear friend, dost thou speak to me thus mournfully to move me to love thee better? Then is thy labour lost, for no better may I love thee than now I do, and that is with mine whole heart. But keep a good courage, I bid thee, for we be not sundered yet, nor shall we be. Nor do I deem that we shall die here, or to-morrow, but many years hence, after we have known all the sweetness of life. Meanwhile I bid thee good night, fair friend. Chapter 27 Morning Amongst the Bears So Walter laid him down, and fell asleep, and knew no more till he awoke in bright daylight, with the maid standing over him. She was fresh from the water, for she had been to the river to bathe her, and the sun through the open door fell streaming on her feet, close to Walter's pillow. He turned about, and cast his arm about them, and caressed them, while she stood smiling upon him. Then he arose and looked on her, and said, How thou art fair and bright this morning! And yet, and yet, were it not well, that thou do off thee all this faded and drooping bravery of leaves and blossoms, that maketh thee look like to a jongler's damsel on a morrow of May Day. And he gazed ruefully on her. She laughed on him merrily, and said, Yea, and belike these others think no better of my attire, or not much better, for yonder they are gathering small wood for the burnt offering, which, forsooth, shall be thou and I, unless I better it all by means of the wisdom I learned of the old woman, and perfected betwixt the stripes of my mistress, whom a little while ago thou lovedst somewhat. And as she spake, her eyes sparkled, her cheek flushed, and her limbs and her feet seemed as if they could scarce refrain from dancing for joy. Then Walter knit his brow, and for a moment a thought half-framed was in his mind. Is it so, that she will bewray me, and live without me? And he cast his eyes on to the ground. But she said, Look up, and into mine eyes, friend, and see if there be in them any falseness toward thee. For I know thy thought, I know thy thought. Dost thou not see that my joy and gladness is for the love of thee, and the thought of the rest from trouble that is at hand. He looked up, and his eyes met the eyes of her love, and he would have cast his arms about her, but she drew back, and said, Nay, thou must refrain thee a while, dear friend, lest these folk cast eyes on us, and deem us over lover like, for what I am to bid them deem me. Abide a while, and then shall all be in me according to thy will. But now I must tell thee that it is not very far from noon, and that the bears are streaming into the dale, and already there is a host of men at the doom ring, and as I said, the bale for the burnt offering is well nigh dight, whether it be for us or for some other creature. And now I have to bid thee this, and it will be a thing easy for thee to do, to wit, that thou look as if thou wert of the race of the gods, and not to blench, or show sign of blenching, whatever betide. 
to yea say both my yea say and my nay say, and lastly this, which is the only hard thing for thee. But thou hast already done it before somewhat, to look upon me with no masterful eyes of love, nor as if thou wert at once praying me and commanding me. Rather, thou shalt so demean thee, as if thou wert my man all simply, and no wise my master. O friend beloved, said Walter, here at least art thou the master, and I will do all thy bidding, in certain hope of this, that either we shall live together, or die together. But as they spoke, in came the elder, and with him a young maiden, bearing with them their breakfast of curds and cream and strawberries, and he bade them eat. So they ate, and were not unmerry, and the while of their eating the elder talked with them soberly, but not hardly, or with any seeming enmity, and ever his talk gat on to the drought, which was now burning up the down pastures, and how the grass in the watered dales, which was no wide spread of land, would not hold out much longer unless the god sent them rain. And Walter noted that those two, the elder and the maid, eyed each other curiously amidst of this talk, the elder intent on what she might say, and if she gave heed to his words, while on her side the maid answered his speech graciously and pleasantly, but said little that was of any import. Nor would she have him fix her eyes, which wandered lightly from this thing to that, nor would her lips grow stern and stable, but ever smiled in answer to the light of her eyes, as she sat there, with her face as the very face of the gladness of the summer day. CHAPTER Twenty Eight, OF THE NEW GOD OF THE BEARS At last the old man said, My children, ye shall now come with me unto the doom-ring of our folk, the bears of the southern dales, and deliver to them your errand, and I beseech you to have pity upon your own bodies, as I have pity on them, on thine especially, maiden, so fair and bright a creature as thou art, for so it is, that if ye deal us out light and lying words, after the manner of dastards, ye shall miss the worship and glory of wending away amidst of the flames, a gift to the god, and a hope to the people, and shall be passed by the rods of the folk, until ye faint and fail amongst them, and then shall ye be thrust down into the flow at the dale's end, and a stone-laden hurdle cast upon you, that we may thenceforth forget your folly. The maid now looked full into his eyes, and Walter deemed that the old man shrank before her, but she said, Thou art old and wise, O great man of the bears, yet nought I need to learn of thee. Now lead us on our way to the stead of the errands. So the elder brought them along to the doom-ring at the eastern end of the dale, and it was now all peopled with those huge men, weaponed after their fashion, and standing up, so that the grey stones thereof but showed a little over their heads. But amidmost of the said ring was a big stone fashioned as a chair, whereon sat a very old man, long hoary and white-bearded, and on either side of him stood a great-limbed woman, clad in war-gear, holding each of them a long spear, and with a flint-bladed knife in the girdle, and there were no other women in all the moat. Then the elder led those twain into the midst of the moat, and there bade them go up on to a wide flat-topped stone six feet above the ground, just over against the ancient chieftain, and they mounted it by a rough stair and stood there before that folk, Walter in his array of the outward world, which had been fair enough of crimson cloth and silk and white linen, but was now travel-stained and worn, and the maid with naught upon her save the smock wherein she had fled from the golden house of the wood beyond the world, decked with the faded flowers which she had wreathed about her yesterday. Nevertheless, so it was that those big men eyed her intently, and with somewhat of worship. Now did Walter, according to her bidding, 
sink down on his knees beside her, and drawing his sword, hold it before him, as if to keep all interlopers aloof from the maid. And there was silence in the moat, and all eyes were fixed on those twain. At last the old chief arose and spake, Ye men, here are come a man and a woman, we know not whence, whereas they have given word to our folk who first met them, that they would tell their errand to none save the moat of the people, which it was their due to do if they were minded to risk it. For either they be aliens, without an errand hither, save it may be to beguile us, in which case they shall presently die an evil death. Or they have come amongst us that we may give them to the god with flintedge and fire. Or they have a message to us from some folk or other, on the issue of which lieth life or death. Now shall ye hear what they have to say concerning themselves and their faring hither. But meseemeth it shall be the woman who is the chief, and hath the word in her mouth. For lo you, the man kneeleth at her feet, as one who would serve and worship her. Speak out, then, woman, and let our warriors hear thee. Then the maid lifted up her voice, and spake out, clear and shrilling, like to a flute of the best of the minstrels. Ye men of the children of the bear, I would ask you a question, and let the chieftain who sitteth before me answer it. The old man nodded his head, and she went on, Tell me, children of the bear, how long a time is worn since ye saw the god of your worship made manifest in the body of a woman? Said the elder, Many winters have worn since my father's father was a child, and saw the very god in the bodily form of a woman. Then she said again, Did ye rejoice at her coming, and would ye rejoice if once more she came amongst you? Yea, said the old chieftain, for she gave us gifts, and learned us law, and came to us in no terrible shape, but as a young woman as goodly as thou. Then said the maid, Now then is the day of your gladness come, for the old body is dead, and I am the new body of your God, come amongst you for your welfare. Then fell a great silence on the moat, till the old man spake, and said, what shall I say and live? For if thou be verily the god, and I threaten thee, wilt thou not destroy me? But thou hast spoken a great word with a sweet mouth, and hast taken the burden of blood on thy lily hands. And if the children of the bear be befooled of light liars, how shall they put the shame off them? Therefore I say, show to us a token, and if thou be the god, this shall be easy to thee. And if thou show it not, then is thy falsehood manifest, and thou shalt dree the weird. For we shall deliver thee into the hands of these women here, who shall thrust thee down into the flow which is hereby, after they have wearied themselves with whipping thee. But thy man that kneeleth at thy feet shall we give to the true God, and he shall go to her by the road of the flint and the fire. Hast thou heard? Then give to us the sign and the token." She changed countenance no whit at his word, but her eyes were the brighter, and her cheek the fresher, and her feet moved a little, as if they were growing glad before the dance, and she looked out over the moat, and spake in her clear voice, Old man, thou needest not to fear for thy words, for sooth it is not me whom thou threatenest with stripes and a foul death, but some light fool and liar, who is not here. Now hearken, I wot well that ye would have somewhat of me, to wit, that I should send you rain to end this drought, which otherwise seemeth like to lie long upon you. But this rain, I must go into the mountains of the south to fetch it you. Therefore shall certain of your warriors bring me on my way, with this, my man, up to the great pass of the said mountains, and we shall set thitherward this very day. She was silent a while, and all looked on her, but none spake or moved, so that they seemed as images of stone amongst the stones. Then she spake again, and said, 
Some would say, men of the bear, that this were a sign and a token great enough. But I know you, and how stubborn and perverse of heart ye be, and how that the gift not yet within your hand is no gift to you, and the wonder ye see not, your hearts trow not. Therefore, look ye upon me as here I stand, I, who have come from the fairer country, and the greenwood of the lands, and see if I bear not the summer with me, and the heart that maketh increase, and the hand that giveth. Lo, then, as she spake, the faded flowers that hung about her, gathered life, and grew fresh again, the woodbine round her neck, and her sleek shoulders, knit itself together, and embraced her freshly, and cast its scent about her face. The lilies that girded her loins lifted up their heads, and the gold of their tassels fell upon her. The eyebright grew clean blue again upon her smock. The eglantine found its blooms again, and then began to shed the leaves thereof upon her feet. The meadow-sweet wreathed amongst it, made clear the sweetness of her legs, and the mouse-ear studded her raiment as with gems. There she stood, amidst of the blossoms, like a great orient pearl against the fretwork of the goldsmiths, and the breeze that came up the valley from behind bore the sweetness of her fragrance all over the man-moat. Then, indeed, the bears stood up, and shouted, and cried, and smote on their shields, and tossed their spears aloft, then the elder rose from his seat, and came up humbly to where she stood, and prayed her to say what she would have done, while the others drew about in knots, but durst not come very nigh to her. She answered the ancient chief, and said that she would depart presently toward the mountains, whereby she might send them the rain which they lacked, and that thence she would away to the southward for a while, but that they should hear of her, or, it might be, see her, before they who were now of middle age should be gone to their fathers. Then the old man besought her that they might make her a litter of fragrant green boughs, and so bear her away toward the mountain pass amidst a triumph of the whole folk. But she leapt lightly down from the stone, and walked to and fro on the green sward, while it seemed of her that her feet scarce touched the grass, and she spake to the ancient chief, where he still kneeled in worship of her, and said, Nay, deemest thou of me that I need bearing by men's hands, or that I shall tire at all when I am doing my will, and I, the very heart of the year's increase? So it is that the going of my feet over your pastures shall make them to thrive both this year and the coming years, surely will I go afoot. So they worshipped her the more, and blessed her, and then first of all they brought meat, the daintiest they might, for both her and for Walter. But they would not look on the maid while she ate, or suffer Walter to behold her the while. Afterwards, when they had eaten, some twenty men, weaponed after their fashion, made them ready to wend with the maiden up into the mountains, and anon they set out thitherward altogether. Howbeit, the huge men held them ever somewhat aloof from the maid, and when they came to the resting-place for that night, where was no house, for it was up amongst the foothills before the mountains, then it was a wonder to see how carefully they built up a sleeping-place for her, and tilted it over with their skin-cloaks, and how they watched night long about her. But Walter they let sleep peacefully on the grass, a little way aloof from the watchers round the maid. Chapter Twenty Nine. Walter strays in the pass and is sundered from the maid. Morning came, and they arose and went on their ways, and went all day till the sun was nigh set, and they were come up into the very pass, and in the jaws thereof was an earthen howl. There the maid bade them stay, and she went up onto the howl, and stood there and spake to them, and said. O men of the bear, I give you thanks for your following, and I bless you, and promise you the increase of the earth, but now ye shall turn aback, and leave me to go my ways, and my man with the iron sword shall follow me. Now, maybe, 
I shall come amongst the bare folk again before long, and yet again, and learn them wisdom, but for this time it is enough. And I shall tell you that ye were best to hasten home straightway to your houses in the downland dales, for the weather which I have bidden for you is even now coming forth from the forge of storms in the heart of the mountains. Now this last word I give you, that times are changed since I wore the last shape of God that ye have seen, wherefore a change I command you. If so be aliens come amongst you, I will not that ye send them to me by the flint and the fire. Rather, unless they be baleful unto you, and worthy of an evil death, ye shall suffer them to abide with you. Ye shall make them become children of the bears, if they be goodly enough and worthy and they shall be my children as ye be. Otherwise, if they be ill-favoured and weakling, let them live and be thralls to you, but not joined with you man to woman. Now depart ye with my blessing. Therewith she came down from the mound, and went her ways up the pass so lightly that it was to Walter, standing amongst the bears, as if she had vanished away, but the men of that folk abode standing and worshipping their god for a little while, and that while he durst not sunder him from their company. But when they had blessed him, and gone on their way backward, he betook him in haste to following the maid, thinking to find her abiding him in some nook of the pass. Howsoever, it was now twilight or more, and, for all his haste, dark night overtook him, so that perforce he was stayed amidst the tangle of the mountain ways. And moreover, ere the night was grown old, the weather came upon him on the back of a great south wind, so that the mountain nooks rattled and roared, and there was the rain and the hail, with thunder and lightning, monstrous and terrible, and all the huge array of a summer storm. So he was driven at last to crouch under a big rock and abide the day, but not so were his troubles at an end, for under the said rock he fell asleep, and when he awoke it was day indeed, but as to the pass, the way thereby was blind with the driving rain and the lowering lift, so that, though he struggled as well as he might against the storm and the tangle, he made but little way. And now, once more, the thought came on him, that the maid was of the fays, or of some race even mightier, and it came on him now not as erst with half fear and whole desire, but with a bitter oppression of dread, of loss and misery, so that he began to fear that she had but won his love to leave him and forget him for a newcomer, after the want of fay women, as old tales tell. Two days he battled thus with storm and blindness, and wan hope of his life, for he was growing weak and foredone. But the third morning the storm abated, though the rain yet fell heavily, and he could see his way somewhat as well as feel it. Withal he found that now his path was leading him downwards. As it grew dusk, he came down into a grassy valley, with a stream running through it to the southward, and the rain was now but little, coming down but in dashes from time to time. So he crept down to the stream side and lay amongst the bushes there, and said to himself that on the morrow he would get him victual, so that he might live to seek his maiden through the wide world. He was of somewhat better heart, but now that he was laid quiet, and had no more for that present to trouble him about the way, the anguish of his loss fell upon him the keener, and he might not refrain him from lamenting his dear maiden aloud, as one who deemed himself in the empty wilderness and thus he lamented for her sweetness and her loveliness, and the kindness of her voice and her speech and her mirth. Then he fell to crying out, concerning the beauty of her shaping, praising the parts of her body as her face and her hands and her shoulders and her feet, and cursing the evil fate which had sundered him from the friendliness of her and the peerless fashion of her. Chapter 30 Now They Meet Again Complaining thus wise, 
he fell asleep from sheer weariness, and when he awoke it was broad day, calm and bright and cloudless, with the scent of the earth refreshed going up into the heavens, and the birds singing sweetly in the bushes about him. For the dale whereunto he was now come was a fair and lovely place amidst the shelving slopes of the mountains, a paradise of the wilderness, and naught but pleasant and sweet things were to be seen there, now that the morn was so clear and sunny. He arose, and looked about him, and saw where, a hundred yards aloof, was a thicket of small wood, as thorn and elder and white bean, all wreathed about with the vines of wayfaring tree. It hid a bite of the stream, which turned round about it, and betwixt it and Walter was the grass short and thick and sweet, and all beset with flowers. And he said to himself, that it was even such a place as wherein the angels were leading the blessed, in the great painted paradise in the choir of the big church at Langton-on-Holm. But lo, as he looked, he cried aloud for joy, for forth from the thicket, on to the flowery grass, came one like to an angel from out of the said picture, white-clad and barefoot, sweet of flesh, with bright eyes and ruddy cheeks, for it was the maid herself, so he ran to her, and she abode him, holding forth kind hands to him, and smiling, while she wept for joy of the meeting. He threw himself upon her, and spared not to kiss her, her cheeks and her mouth and her arms and her shoulders, and wheresoever she would suffer it, till at last she drew her back a little, laughing on him for love, and said, Forbear now, friend, for it is enough for this time and tell me how thou hast sped. Ill, ill, said he. What ails thee? she said. Hunger, he said, and longing for thee. Well, she said, me thou hast, there is one ill quenched. Take my hand, and we will see to the other one. So he took her hand, and to hold it, seemed to him sweet beyond measure. But he looked up, and saw a little blue smoke going up into the air from beyond the thicket, and he laughed, for he was weak with hunger, and he said, Who is at the cooking yonder? Thou shalt see, she said, and led him therewith into the said thicket, and through it, and lo, a fair little grassy place, full of flowers, betwixt the bushes and the bite of the stream, and on the sandy air, just off the greensward, was a fire of sticks, and beside it two trouts, lying, fat and red-flecked. "'Here is the breakfast,' said she. "'When it was time to wash the night off me, e'en now, I went down to the strand here into the rippling shallow, and saw the bank below it, where the water draws together yonder, and deepens, that it seemed like to hold fish.' and whereas I looked to meet thee presently, I groped the bank for them, going softly, and lo thou, help me now, that we cook them. So they roasted them on the red embers, and fell to and ate well, both of them, and drank of the water of the stream out of each other's hollow hands, and that feast seemed glorious to them, such gladness went with it. But when they were done with their meat, Walter said to the maid, and how didst thou know that thou shouldst see me presently? She said, looking on him wistfully, This needed no wizardry. I lay not so far from thee last night, but that I heard thy voice and knew it. Said he, Why didst thou not come to me then, since thou heardest me bemoaning thee? She cast her eyes down, and plucked at the flowers and grass, and said, It was dear to hear thee praising me. I knew not before that I was so sore desired, or that thou hadst taken such note of my body and found it so dear. Then she reddened sorely, and said, I knew not that aught of me had such beauty as thou didst bewail. And she wept for joy. Then she looked on him, and smiled, and said, Wilt thou have the very truth of it? 
I went close up to thee, and stood there hidden by the bushes and the night. And amidst thy bewailing I knew that thou wouldst soon fall asleep, and in sooth I outwaked thee. Then was she silent again, and he spake not, but looked on her shyly, and she said, reddening yet more, Furthermore, I must needs tell thee that I feared to go to thee in the dark night, and my heart so yearning towards thee. And she hung her head adown, but he said, Is it so indeed, that thou fearest me? Then doth that make me afraid, afraid of thy naysay? For I was going to entreat thee, and say to thee, Beloved, we have now gone through many troubles, let us now take a good reward at once, and wed together, here amidst the sweet and pleasant house of the mountains, ere we go further on our way, if indeed we go further at all, for where shall we find any place sweeter or happier than this? But she sprang up to her feet, and stood there trembling before him, because of her love, and she said, Beloved, I have deemed that it were good for us to go seek mankind as they live in the world, and to live amongst them, and as for me, I will tell thee the sooth, to wit, that I long for this sorely, for I feel afraid in the wilderness, and as if I needed help and protection against my mistress, though she be dead, and I need the comfort of many people, and the throngs of the cities. I cannot forget her. It was but last night that I dreamed, I suppose as the dawn grew a cold, that I was yet under her hand, and she was stripping me for the torment, so that I woke up panting and crying out. I pray thee, be not angry with me for telling thee of my desires, for if thou wouldst not have it so, then here will I abide with thee as thy mate, and strive to gather courage. He rose up, and kissed her face, and said, Nay, I had in sooth no mind to abide here for ever. I meant but that we should feast a while here, and then depart, sooth it is, that if thou dreadest the wilderness, somewhat I dread the city. She turned pale, and said, Thou shalt have thy will, my friend, if it must be so. But bethink thee we be not yet at our journey's end, and may have many things and much strife to endure, before we be at peace and in welfare. Now shall I tell thee, did I not before, that while I am a maid untouched, my wisdom, and some deal of might, abideth with me, and only so long. Therefore I entreat thee, let us go now, side by side, out of this fair valley, even as we are, so that my wisdom and might may help thee at need. For, my friend, I would not that our lives be short, so much of joy as hath now come into them. Yea, beloved, he said, let us on straightway then, and shorten the while that sundereth us. Love, she said, thou shalt pardon me one time for all. But this is to be said, that I know somewhat of the haps that lie a little way ahead of us, partly by my law, and partly by what I learned of this land of the wild folk, whilst thou wert lying asleep that morning. So they left that pleasant place by the water, and came into the open valley, and went their ways through the pass, and it soon became stony again, as they mounted the bent which went up from out the dale. And when they came to the brow of the said bent, they had a sight of the open country, lying fair and joyous in the sunshine, and amidst of it, against the blue hills, the walls and towers of a great city. Then said the maid, O oh dear friend, lo you, is not that our abode that lieth yonder, and is so beauteous? Dwell not our friends there, and our protection against uncouth whites, and mere evil things in guileful shapes? O oh city, I bid thee hail! But Walter looked on her, and smiled somewhat, and said, I rejoice in thy joy. But there be evil things in yonder city also, though they be not fays nor devils, or it is like to no city that I wot of. And in every city shall foes grow up to us, without rhyme or reason, 
and life therein shall be tangled unto us. Yea, she said, but in the wilderness, amongst the devils, what was to be done by manly might or valiancy? There hadst thou to fall back upon the guile and wizardry which I had filched from my very foes. But when we come down yonder, then shall thy valiancy prevail to cleave the tangle for us. Or at the least, it shall leave a tale of thee behind, and I shall worship thee. He laughed, and his face grew brighter. Mastery mows the meadow, quoth he, and one man is of little might against many. But I promise thee, I shall not be slothful before thee. Chapter 31 They Come Upon New Folk With that they went down from the bent again, and came to where the pass narrowed so much that they went betwixt a steep wall of rock on either side. But after an hour's going, the said wall gave back suddenly, and, or they were where almost, they came on another dell like to that which they had left, but not so fair though it was grassy and well watered, and not so big either. But here indeed befell a change to them, for lo, tents and pavilions pitched in the said valley, and amidst of it a throng of men, mostly weaponed, and with horses ready saddled at hand. So they stayed their feet, and Walter's heart failed him, for he said to himself, Who wotteth what these men may be, save that they be aliens? it is most like that we shall be taken as thralls, and then, at the best, we shall be sundered, and that is all one with the worst. But the maid, when she saw the horses, and the gay tents, and the pennons fluttering, and the glitter of spears, and gleaming of white armour, smote her palms together for joy, and cried out, Here now are come the folk of the city for our welcoming, and fair and lovely are they, and of many things shall they be thinking, and of many things shall they do, and we shall be partakers thereof. Come then, and let us meet them, fair friend. But Walter said, Alas, thou knowest not, would that we might flee, but now is it over late, so put we a good face on it, and go to them quietly, as erewhile we did in the bear country. So did they and there sundered six from the men-at-arms, and came to those twain, and made humble obeisance to Walter, but spake no word. Then they made as they would lead them to the others, and the twain went with them, wandering, and came in to the ring of men-at-arms, and stood before an old whore knight, armed all save his head with most goodly armour, and he also bowed before Walter, but spake no word. Then they took them to the master pavilion, and made signs to them to sit, and they brought them dainty meat and good wine. And the while of their eating arose up a stir about them, and when they were done with their meat, the ancient knight came to them, still bowing in courteous wise, and did them to wit by signs that they should depart. And when they were without, they saw all the other tents struck, and men beginning to busy them with striking the pavilion, and the others mounted and ranked in good order for the road, and there were two horse-litters before them, wherein they were bidden to mount, Walter in one, and the maid in the other, and no otherwise might they do. Then presently was a horn blown, and all took to the road together, and Walter saw betwixt the curtains of the litter that men-at-arms rode on either side of him, albeit they had left him his sword by his side. So they went down the mountain passes, and before sunset were gotten into the plain, but they made no stay for nightfall, save to eat a morsel and drink a draught, going through the night as men who knew their way well. As they went, Walter wondered what would betide, and if, peradventure, they also would be for offering them up to their gods, whereas they were aliens for certain, and belike also Saracens. Moreover, there was a cold fear at his heart that he should be sundered from the maid, whereas their masters now were mighty men of war, holding in their hands that which all men desire, to wit, the manifest beauty of a woman. Yet he strove to think the best of it that he might. And so, at last, 
when the night was far spent and dawn was at hand, they stayed at a great and mighty gate in a huge wall. There they blew loudly on the horn thrice, and thereafter the gates were opened, and they all passed through into a street, which seemed to Walter in the glimmer, to be both great and goodly amongst the abodes of men. Then it was but a little ere they came into a square, wide-spreading, one side whereof Walter took to be the front of a most goodly house. There the doors of the court opened to them, or ever the horn might blow, though forsooth blow it did loudly three times. All they entered therein, and men came to Walter, and signed to him to alight. So did he, and would have tarried to look about for the maid, but they suffered it not, but led him up a huge stair into a chamber, very great, and but dimly lighted because of its greatness. Then they brought him to a bed dight as fair as might be, and made signs to him to strip and lie therein. Perforce he did so, and then they bore away his raiment and left him lying there. So he lay there quietly, deeming it no avail for him, a mother-naked man, to seek escape thence, but it was long ere he might sleep, because of his trouble of mind. At last, pure weariness got the better of his hopes and fears, and he fell into slumber, just as the dawn was passing into day. Chapter 32 Of the New King of the City and Land of Starkwall When he awoke again, the sun was shining brightly into that chamber, and he looked, and beheld that it was peerless of beauty and riches, amongst all that he had ever seen, the ceiling done with gold and oversea blue, the walls hung with arras of the finest, though he might not tell what was the history done therein. The chairs and stools were of a carven work, well bepainted, and amidmost was a great ivory chair under a cloth of estate, of bordekin of gold and green, much bepearled, and all the floor was of fine work Alexandrine. He looked on all this, wondering what had befallen him, when, lo, there came folk into the chamber, to wit, two serving-men well bedight, and three old men clad in rich gowns of silk. These came to him, and, still by signs, without speech, bade him arise and come with them. And when he bade them look to it that he was naked, and laughed doubtfully, they neither laughed in answer, nor offered him any raiment, but still would have him arise, and he did so perforce. They brought him with them out of the chamber, and through certain passages pillared and goodly, till they came to a bath as fair as any might be, and there the serving-men washed him carefully and tenderly, the old men looking on the while. When it was done, still they offered not to clothe him, but led him out and through the passages again, back to the chamber. Only this time he must pass between a double hedge of men, some weaponed, some in peaceful array, but all clad gloriously, and full chieftain-like of aspect, either for valiancy or wisdom. In the chamber itself was now a concourse of men, of great estate by deeming of their array, but all these were standing orderly in a ring about the ivory chair aforesaid. Now said Walter to himself, Surely all this looks toward the knife and the altar for me. But he kept a stout countenance despite of all. So they led him up to the ivory chair, and he beheld on either side thereof a bench, and on each was laid a set of raiment from the shirt upwards. But there was much diversity betwixt these arrays. For one was all of robes of peace, glorious and begemmed, unmeet for any save a great king, while the other was war-weed, seemly, well-fashioned, but little adorned, nay, rather worn and bestained with weather, and the pelting of the spear-storm. Now those old men signed to Walter to take which of those raiments he would, and do it on. He looked to the right and to the left, and when he had looked on the war-gear, the heart arose in him, 
and he called to mind the array of the Goldings in the forefront of battle, and he made one step toward the weapons, and laid his hand thereon. Then ran a glad murmur through that concourse, and the old men drew up to him smiling and joyous, and helped him to do them on, and as he took up the helm he noted that over its broad brown iron sat a golden crown. So when he was clad and weaponed, girt with a sword, and a steel axe in his hand, the elder showed him to the ivory throne, and he laid the axe on the arm of the chair, and drew forth the sword from the scabbard, and sat him down, and laid the ancient blade across his knees. Then he looked about on those great men, and spake. How long shall we speak no word to each other, or is it so that God hath stricken you dumb? Then all they cried out with one voice, All hail to the king, the king of battle. Spake Walter, If I be king, will ye do my will as I bid you? Answered the elder, Nought have we will to do, Lord, save as thou biddest. Said Walter, Thou then, wilt thou answer a question in all truth? Yea, Lord, said the elder, if I may live afterward. Then said Walter, The woman that came with me into your camp of the mountain, what hath befallen her? The elder answered, Nought hath befallen her, either of good or evil, save that she hath slept, and eaten, and bathed her. What, then, is the king's pleasure concerning her? That ye bring her hither to me straightway, said Walter. Yea, said the elder, and in what guise shall we bring her hither? Shall she be arrayed as a servant, or a great lady? Then Walter pondered a while, and spake at last. Ask her what is her will herein, and as she will have it, so let it be. But set ye another chair beside mine, and lead her thereto. Thou wise old man, send one or two to bring her in hither, but abide thou, for I have a question or two to ask of thee yet. And ye lords, abide here the coming of my she-fellow, if it weary you not. So the elder spake to three of the most honourable of the lords, and they went their ways to bring in the maid. Chapter 33 Concerning the Fashion of King-Making in Starkwall Meanwhile the king spake to the elder, and said, Now tell me whereof I am become king, and what is the fashion and cause of the king-making, for wondrous it is to me, whereas I am but an alien amidst of mighty men. Lord, said the old man, thou art become king of a mighty city, which hath under it many other cities and wide lands, and havens by the seaside, and which lacketh no wealth which men desire. Many wise men dwell therein, and of fools not more than in other lands. A valiant host shall follow thee to battle, when needs must thou wend a field. A host not to be withstood, save by the ancient godfolk, if any of them were left upon the earth, as belike none are. And as to the name of our said city, it height the city of the Starkwall, or more shortly, Starkwall. Now, as to the fashion of our king-making, if our king dieth, and leaveth an heir male, begotten of his body, then is he king after him. But if he die, and leave no heir, then send we out a great lord, with knights and sergeants, to that pass of the mountain whereto ye came yesterday, and the first man that cometh unto them they take and lead to the city, as they did with thee, Lord. For we believe and trow that of old time our forefathers came down from the mountains by that same pass, poor and rude, but full of valiancy, before they conquered these lands and builded the stark wall. But now, furthermore, when we have gotten the said wanderer and brought him home to our city, we behold him mother naked, all the great men of us, both sages and warriors. Then, if we find him ill-fashioned and counterfeit of his body, we roll him in a great carpet till he dies, or whiles, if he be but a simple man, and without guile, 
we deliver him for thrall to some artificer amongst us, as a shoemaker, a right, or what not, and so forget him. But in either case we make as if no such man had come to us, and we send again the lord and his knights to watch the pass, for we say that such a one the fathers of old time have not sent us. But again, when we have seen to the newcomer that he is well fashioned of his body, all is not done, for we deem that never would the fathers send us a dolt or a craven to be our king. Therefore we bid the naked one take to him which he will of these raiments, either the ancient armour, which now thou bearest, Lord, or this golden raiment here. And if he take the war-gear, as thou takest it, king, it is well. But if he take the raiment of peace, then hath he the choice either to be thrall of some good man of the city, or to be proven how wise he may be, and so fair the narrow edge betwixt death and kingship. For if he fall short of his wisdom, then shall he die the death. Thus is thy question answered, king, and praise be to the fathers that they have sent us one whom none may doubt, either for wisdom or valiancy. Chapter 34 Now cometh the maid to the king. Then all they bowed before the king, and he spake again, What is that noise that I hear without? as if it were the rising of the sea on a sandy shore, when the south-west wind is blowing. Then the elder opened his mouth to answer. But before he might get out the word, there was a stir without the chamber door, and the throng parted, and lo, amidst of them came the maid, and she yet clad in naught save the white coat, wherewith she had won through the wilderness, save that on her head was a garland of red roses, and her middle was wreathed with the same. Fresh and fair she was, as the dawn of June, her face bright, red-lipped and clear-eyed, and her cheeks flushed with hope and love. She went straight to Walter where he sat, and lightly put away with her hand the elder, who would lead her to the ivory throne beside the king. But she knelt down before him, and laid her hand on his steel-clad knee, and said, O oh, my lord, now I see that thou hast beguiled me, and that thou wert all along a king-born man, coming home to thy realm. But so dear thou hast been to me, and so fair and clear, and so kind withal do thine eyes shine on me from under the grey war-helm, that I will beseech thee not to cast me out utterly, but suffer me to be thy servant and handmaid for a while. Wilt thou not? But the king stooped down to her, and raised her up, and stood on his feet, and took her hands and kissed them, and set her down beside him, and said to her, Sweetheart, this is now thy place, till the night cometh, even by my side. So she sat down there, meek and valiant, her hands laid in her lap, and her feet one over the other, while the king said, Lords, this is my beloved and my spouse. Now, therefore, if ye will have me for king, ye must worship this one for queen and lady, or else suffer us both to go our ways in peace. Then all they that were in the chamber cried aloud, The queen, the lady, the beloved of our lord. And this cry came from their hearts, and not their lips only. For as they looked on her, and the brightness of her beauty, they saw also the meekness of her demeanour, and the high heart of her, and they all fell to loving her. But the young men of them, their cheeks flushed as they beheld her, and their hearts went out to her, and they drew their swords and brandished them aloft, and cried out for her as men made suddenly drunk with love, the queen, the lady, the lovely one. Chapter 35 Of the King of Starkwall and his Queen But while this betid, that murmur without, which is aforesaid, grew louder, and it smote on the king's ear, and he said again to the elder, Tell us now of that noise withoutward, what is it? Said the elder, If thou, king, and the queen, wilt but arise and stand in the window, 
and go forth into the hanging gallery thereof, then shall ye know at once what is this rumour, and therewithal shall ye see a sight meet to rejoice the heart of a king new come into kingship. So the king arose, and took the maid by the hand, and went to the window and looked forth, and lo, the great square of the place all thronged with folk as thick as they could stand, and the more part of the carles with a weapon in hand, and many armed right gallantly. Then he went out into the gallery with his queen, still holding her hand, and his lords and wise men stood behind him. Straightway then arose a cry, and a shout of joy and welcome that rent the very heavens, and the great place was all glittering and strange with the tossing up of spears and the brandishing of swords, and the stretching forth of hands. But the maid spake softly to King Walter, and said, Here then is the wilderness left behind a long way, and here is warding and protection against the foes of our life and soul. O blessed be thou and thy valiant heart! But Walter spake nothing, but stood as one in a dream, and yet, if that might be, his longing toward her increased manifold. But down below, amidst of the throng, stood two neighbours somewhat a night of the window, and quoth one to the other, See thou, the new man in the ancient armour of the Battle of the Waters, bearing the sword that slew the foeman king on the day of the doubtful onset. Surely this is a sign of good luck to us all. Yea, said the second, he beareth his armour well, and the eyes are bright in the head of him. But hast thou beheld well his she-fellow, and what the like of her is? I see her, said the other, that she is a fair woman, yet somewhat worse clad than simply. She is in her smock, man, and were it not for the balusters, I deem ye should see her barefoot. What is amiss with her? Dost thou not see her, said the second neighbour, that she is not only a fair woman, but yet more, one of those lovely ones that draw the heart out of a man's body, one may scarce say for why. Surely Stark Wall hath cast a lucky net this time. And as to her raiment, I see of her that she is clad in white, and wreathed with roses, but that the flesh of her is so wholly pure and sweet that it maketh all her attire but a part of her body, and halloweth it, so that it hath the semblance of gems. Alas, my friend, let us hope that this queen will fare abroad unseldom amongst the people. Thus then they spake. But after a while the king and his mates went back into the chamber, and he gave command that the women of the queen should come and fetch her away, to attire her in royal array and thither came the fairest of the honourable damsels, and were fain of being her waiting-women. Therewithal the king was unarmed, and dight most gloriously, but still he bore the sword of the king's slaying, and sithence so were the king and the queen brought into the great hall of the palace, and they met on a dais, and kissed before the lords and other folk that thronged the hall. There they ate a morsel, and drank a cup together, while all beheld them, and then they were brought forth, and a white horse of the goodliest, well bedight, brought for each of them. And thereon they mounted, and went their ways together, by the lane which the huge throng made for them, to the great church, for the hallowing and the crowning. And they were led by one squire alone, and he unarmed, for such was the custom of Starkwall when a new king should be hallowed. So came they to the great church, for that folk was not miscreant, so to say. And they entered it, they two alone, and went into the choir. And when they had stood there a little while, wondering at their lot, they heard how the bells fell a-ringing tunefully over their heads, and then drew near the sound of many trumpets blowing together, and thereafter the voices of many folk singing. And then were the great doors thrown open, and the bishop and his priests came into the church with singing and minstrelsy. And thereafter came the whole throng of the folk, and presently the nave of the church was filled by it, as when the water follows the cutting of the dam and fills up the dyke. Thereafter came the bishop and his mates into the choir 
and came up to the king, and gave him and the queen the kiss of peace. This was mass sung gloriously, and thereafter was the king anointed and crowned, and great joy made throughout the church. Afterwards they went back afoot to the palace, they two alone together, with none but the esquire going before to show them the way. And as they went, they passed close beside those two neighbours, whose talk has been told of afore, and the first one, he who had praised the king's war array, spake and said, Truly, neighbour, thou art in the right of it, and now the queen has been dight duly, and hath a crown on her head, and is clad in white samite done all over with pearls, I see her to be of exceeding goodliness, as goodly may be as the Lord King. Quoth the other, Unto me she seemeth as she did, e'en now. She is clad in white, as then she was, and it is by reason of the pure and sweet flesh of her that the pearls shine out and glow, and by the holiness of her body is her rich attire hallowed. But, forsooth, it seemed to me as she went past, as though paradise had come anigh to our city, and that all the air breathed of it. So I say, praise be to God and his hallows, who hath suffered her to dwell amongst us. Said the first man, Forsooth it is well, but knowest thou at all whence she cometh, and of what lineage she may be? Nay, said the other, I wot not whence she is, but this I wot full surely, that when she goeth away, they whom she leadeth with her shall be well bestead. Again, of her lineage nought know I, but this I know, that they that come of her to the twentieth generation shall bless and praise the memory of her, and hallow her name little less than they hallow the name of the mother of God. So spake those two, but the king and queen came back to the palace, and sat among the lords and at the banquet which was held thereafter, and long was the time of their glory, till the night was far spent and all men must seek to their beds. Chapter 36 Of Walter and the Maid in the Days of the Kingship Long it was, indeed, till the women, by the king's command, had brought the maid to the king's chamber, and he met her, and took her by the shoulders and kissed her, and said, Art thou not weary, sweetheart? Doth not the city, and the thronging folk, and the watching eyes of the great ones, Doth it not all lie heavy on thee, as it doth upon me? She said, And where is the city now? Is not this the wilderness again, and thou and I alone together therein? He gazed at her eagerly, and she reddened, so that her eyes shone light amidst the darkness of the flush of her cheeks. He spake trembling and softly, and said, is it not in one matter better than the wilderness? Is not the fear gone, yea, every whit thereof? The dark flush had left her face, and she looked on him exceeding sweetly, and spoke steadily and clearly. Even so it is, beloved. Therewith she set her hand to the girdle that girt her loins, and did it off, and held it out toward him, and said, Here is the token, this is a maid's girdle, and the woman is ungirt. So he took the girdle, and her hand withal, and cast his arms about her, and amidst the sweetness of their love and their safety, and assured hope of many days of joy, they spake together of the hours when they fared the razor edge betwixt guile and misery and death, and the sweeter yet it grew to them because of it. And many things she told him ere the dawn, of the evil days bygone, and the dealings of the mistress with her, till the grey days stole into the chamber to make manifest her loveliness, which, forsooth, was better even than the deeming of that man amidst the throng whose heart had been so drawn towards her. So they rejoiced together in the new day. But when the full day was, and Walter arose, he called his thanes and wise men to the council, and first he bade open the prison doors, and feed the needy and clothe them, and make good cheer to all men, 
high and low, rich and unrich. And thereafter he took counsel with them on many matters, and they marvelled at his wisdom and the keenness of his wit. And so it was, that some were but half pleased thereat, whereas they saw that their will was like to give way before his in all matters. But the wiser of them rejoiced in him, and looked for good days while his life lasted. Now of the deeds that he did, and his joys and his griefs, the tale shall tell no more, nor of how he saw Langton again, and his dealings there. In Starkwall he dwelt, and reigned a king, well beloved of his folk, sorely feared of their foemen. Strife he had to deal with, at home and abroad, but therein he was not quelled till he fell asleep fair and softly, when this world had no more of deeds for him to do. Nor may it be said that the needy lamented him, for no needy had he left in his own land, and few foes he left behind to hate him. As to the maid, she so waxed in loveliness and kindness, that it was a year's joy for any to have cast eyes upon her, in street or on field. All wizardry left her since the day of her wedding, yet of wit and wisdom she had enough left, and to spare, for she needed no going about and no guile, any more than hard commands, to have her will done. So loved she was by all folk, forsooth, that it was a mere joy for any to go about her errands. To be short, she was the land's increase, and the city's safeguard, and the bliss of the folk. Somewhat, as the days passed, it misgave her that she had beguiled the bare folk to deem her their god, and she considered and thought how she might atone it. So the second year after they had come to Starkwall, she went with certain folk to the head of the pass that led down to the bears, and there she stayed the men-at-arms, and went on further with a two-score of husbandmen, whom she had redeemed from thraldom in Starkwall. And when they were hard on the dales of the bears, she left them there, in a certain little dale, with their wains and horses and seed-corn and iron tools, and went down all bird alone to the dwelling of those huge men, unguarded now by sorcery, and trusting in naught but her loveliness and kindness. Clad she was now, as when she fled from the wood beyond the world, in a short white coat alone, with bare feet and naked arms, but the said coat was now embroidered with the imagery of blossoms in silk and gold, and gems, whereas now her wizardry had departed from her. So she came to the bears, and they knew her at once, and worshipped and blessed her, and feared her. But she told them that she had a gift for them, and was come to give it, and therewith she told them of the art of tillage, and bade them learn it, and when they asked her how they should do so, she told them of the men who were abiding them in the mountain dale, and bade the bears take them for their brothers and sons of the ancient fathers, and then they should be taught of them. This they behight her to do, and so she led them to where her freedmen lay, whom the bears received with all joy and loving kindness, and took them into their folk. So they went back to their dales together, but the maid went her ways back to her men-at-arms and the city of Starkwall. Thereafter she sent more gifts and messages to the bears, but never again went herself to see them, for as good a face as she put on it that last time, yet her heart waxed cold with fear, and it almost seemed to her that her mistress was alive again, and that she was escaping from her and plotting against her once more. As for the bears, they throve and multiplied, till at last strife arose great and grim betwixt them and other peoples, for they had become mighty in battle. Yea, once and again they met the host of Starkwall in fight, and overthrew, and were overthrown. But that was a long while after the maid had passed away. Now of Walter and the maid is no more to be told, saving that they begat between them goodly sons and fair daughters whereof came a great lineage in Starkwall, which lineage was so strong, and endured so long a while, that by then it had died out, 
folk had clean forgotten their ancient custom of king-making. So that after Walter of Langton, there was never another king that came down to them, poor and lonely, from out of the mountains of the bears. End of section 12 End of The Wood Beyond the World by William Morris